looking at the invocation to Saraswati. So let's join together with the hands to Anjali Mudra. And if you want to see, you can see this, this Saraswati chant here. Om Saraswati Namastupyam Varade Kamarupini Vidya Rambam Karishami Sit here Pavatume Sada We'll go right into the next one. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhanaktu Saha Viryam Karavavahai Tejasvinavadi Tamastu Ma vid vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om Vande Gurunam Charenara Vinde Sandarshita Swatma Sukhava Bode Nishreya Se Jangali Kayamane Samsara Halla Halla Moha Shantye Ava Purusha Karam Shanka Chakrasi Dharinam Sahasra Shirasam Shetam Pranamami Patanjalim Om Now let's chant one more chant to Patanjali and then we'll discuss what we chanted. Yogena Chittasya Padena Vacham Malam shari rasya cha vaitya kena yo pakarotam pravaram moninam patanjalim pranjalir anatosmi om shanti 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 Wonderful. So why would we first start chanting to Saraswati, the goddess of learning? And we can see that Saraswati here, the first chant we did, is the one that any, you want to chant to Saraswati before you um, start talking about philosophy and theory. And she's the one that's going to help us guide us towards this more intellectual discussion on the philosophy and the psyche of yoga. So she's just a nice chant to practice. The next one we chanted, as we know, is Sahana Vavatu. This is the chant that we chant to our teachers. So we're, we're continuing the relationship of our practice, our actual daily practice as our teacher, but our teachers of the people we learn from and their teachers. So it's also we're chanting to all of these different layers of yoga, the parampara, this lineage has been passed down through generation to generation, usually just through oral teachings. And they're, they're alive. It's very alive. Like Ashtanga yoga is very alive. Like I feel so, so, so blessed that the teachers that are around us are here now. And they have so much to share with us that, that we are a part of that and we participate in that. So this is what that prayer is about. May our study together be, be luminous, be not with any discord and always at peace. We chanted the invocation to practice, that we're accepting that we're ready to move from moha, a delusion, towards shanti, peace. And we're looking for some sort of pathway that will help guide us. And that we also recognize that it is here, the person that we're going to go look towards is Patanjali, the, the, the philosophy that's going to support us. So 
the second part of this chant is really about accepting that we were looking to the philosoph philosophical teachings of Patanjali. And so most of my teachings that I share with you are always going to be based in that because that's a concrete ground for me. It was passed down from David Garig, taught me, you, know, you need to, he almost completely taught me third series by saying, Prayatna Shaitilia Ananda Sama Patibyan. He kept telling me that, telling me that. Like, what is he saying? And Patabi Joyce taught him that you have to use the right amount of effort, Prayatna Shaitilia Ananta, to bring you towards knowing how to do the posture. So, why he was continually telling me that was to teach me if you're going to learn asana, you have to learn the right amount of effort and breath to apply to it. So that's one of the definitions of asana. And then I tried to train it a little bit, but I never really got serious until 2012. And I got really started diving into sutra chanting and chanting and learning more about the sutras. So that's why I'm going to share a lot of that today. Our talk well, based on the yoga sutras. Look at the meaning of Ashtanga Yoga. Ashtanga Yoga is based on the Ashtanga Yoga philosophy in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. So it's inevitable that you as a practitioner, a daily practitioner of Vinyasa Yoga, you're going to be wanting to learn more deeper questions about why you practice. When you lay on, the, on your mat in Shavasana after your practice, or when you start your practice, you constantly get reminded of why you practice. What was that reason that got you on the mat in the first place? And if you aren't reminded of that often, somewhere in the practice, oh yeah, that first time I took my first class. Oh, those, those, are, the ways, those are the ways that get you back on your mat every day. So sitting and taking a moment to remember why, what first got you there is really important because then it takes off all that edge of striving or wanting. And it makes you remember that those early days of, of what made you return all the time, what makes you continue to return. The next chant, the final chant we chanted was to Patanjali himself, Yogena Chitasya Padena Vacham. So we're, we're actually addressing that we're giving thanks to this, this idea of, of greater, greater philosophy that supports us. So when we need help, we look to the sutras, we look to Patanjali. So today, our, our monthly conference, I'm gonna talk a lot about what limits us from practicing yoga? What holds us back from achieving the samadhi, the absorption of the self? And that is a complex thing that we want to address because as we start to practice more and more yoga and get more and more interested in what and we're doing, we're noticing that stuff comes up. We get, we kind of get either stopped or something kicks us off our plan whether it was a bad night's sweet sleep, a diet, um, something in our lifestyle, something that happened externally that we weren't in control over. We want to look at those. Why is it that we get, oh, I lost my practice for a while. Was it a physical thing? Was it um, just lifestyle? We want to look at that. And we will look at how we're going to maintain those practices. So let's just look for a moment at the sutras here. This sutra is very important, yoga one, two. Yogaha chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is the chitta, the mind field, and the churning of the mind field, the vrittis, your thoughts, and learning how to still it. It's pretty easy, right? Not so bad. Otherwise, we identify with the churnings of the mind because we want, we don't, we don't get that we 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 didn't really quite get this idea that thrashed it. We didn't identify with that. We we didn't quite. We couldn't still the churnings of the mind, so we identified with what we were thinking about. We went ahead and did that instead of, ah, then the drashtuhu swarupe in zone form. Then, or you, when we still the mind, we're able to stand in our own form. What does that mean? We're able to listen to the higher conscious self, and that's what I want to get to. However, let's look at this. But he's saying otherwise we identify with the thought patterns, and they are these. The vrittis, these churnings of the thought, there's five of them. And knowing this is very important, it's going to help you a lot. They are this is special word. They're either klishta or they're aklishtaha. What does that mean? Klishta means they're not helping us. 
<laughs> the thought pattern that doesn't help us still the mind. Zoom, 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 zoom. The thinking patterns, what are they? We'll get to them in a minute. Some of them are helpful to yoga. Aklishta, or not. Now, klish is a special word. The root of klish, K-L-I-S, means detrimental. It means, it means like there is, they are actually to torment or to cause trouble, Edwin Bryant says in his book on page 174 for, for very philo philosophical bus. So what is, if a klish, the root of klishta means to be detrimental, that means the thought patterns, the vrittis aren't gonna help us find yoga. So we have to watch our thoughts. Watch, what kind of thoughts do we have? And this is the ones that are important. Right perception, pramana, vipariyaya, not getting it right, wrong perception, vikalpa, living in metaphor or in daydreaming, sleep, nidra, and memory, smartayaha. So out of those five thought patterns, some are detrimental to yoga. Which ones? Maybe sleep, maybe not. Sleep is good. You need to have good sleep to have a clear mind. But a smartayaha, memory. Is a memory going to be klishta or aklishta? Harmful? or helpful towards achieving yoga, depends. If you had a negative experience, that memory could be put in the body as mm, an aversion, and it could become a klishta, ne a, a klishta, a negative thing. But if it's a memory that's positive, such as a healthy relationship with your practice and your teacher and a lot of years practicing through, through trials and errors and, and injuries, and you're always on your mat no matter what, and you stick with it, then the memory might be different on how you approach your philosophy to your practice. Now, why are we talking about the vrittis? Your thought patterns directly relate to your impediments to yoga. So if we can understand yoga is, we just decided that yoga is de defined, yoga chitta vritti nirodha is learning how to still these vrittis. We have to learn how to still the mind. Then, when we look at chapter two, and he talks about our sadhana, actually building our practice, this is where he starts to talk about the big kleshas, kleshas. And these are what we're talking about today. These are your big obstacles to yoga. But look, they're rooted in the same word, klish, klesh, very similar. And let's talk about this. When we look at chapter two, and this is very important. He's saying that through effort, tapaha, Swadhyaya, personal study, and Ishvara Pranidhanani, devotion to the divine. So effort, austerities, devotion, and self-study. We're going to practice this yoga of action called Kriya Yoga. This is what we're doing every day. We are doing these three things when we're practicing Ashtanga Yoga. This is, uh, these are the path, the path of, of action consists of self-study, devotion to the divine, and work, yeah? Okay, so now, what is this? This is the most important one here. It's gonna bring about samadhi, samadhi bhavana, when we do those three things. The purpose, artaha, is to bring about samadhi. Ooh, but there's that word klesha. Klesha tanu karanartascha, and to reduce the kleshas. So klesha are the afflictions. These are the things that, of impediment. They, they like the vrittis, the churnings of the mind, the thoughts that could be not helpful to yoga, klesh, uh, klesh, excuse me. This is similar. This is saying the five, five things that hold you back from achieving yoga, ignorance, getting it wrong, mistaking it, not knowing, a deep imprint that's like, I don't want to do that and I don't know why. I'm not going there. Or it don't even know it's there. We'll talk about these in a minute. Ego, attachment, aversion. There's that aversion that came from that aklishta memory of something that went wrong. And the clinging to life. So Kriya Yoga, these yogas of actions, right? The three, Tapa, Swadhyaya, and Ishwara. Devotion to the Lord, studying the self, action on our mat. If, this, if Kriya Yoga is going to weaken, to weaken the kleshas, that's what this is going to do. Bring about samadhi and to weaken the kleshas. Then 
really we are we are free to, to to reduce that those 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 big thought patterns that could be negative but they're also the actions that come with them so the result these are like kind of what happens when we lose control of the thoughts when we lose control of the thoughts then they become big big obstacles to practice sure thing. Yeah. okay what we want what are these okay. what is this big one here this this um klesha uh, so yeah. Just give me a second for just a second. We have too many meetings in my house right now. Excuse me. Give me one minute. I'm sorry, everybody. Let's see if this is a little bit more quieter. I didn't understand that there was going to be a giant conference going on during our conference. Okay, so when we have these obstacles to yoga, the one I want to talk about more, the most, the klesha, the obstacle of avidya. Now, the avidya is the one we want to really think about when we're practicing because this is the one that is the big one the one that makes us not practice. Okay. Avidya, kshetram, uttaresham, prasupta tanu, vichena, udaranam. Now, there, when you have something that's lost or the deep impression that's forgotten about, it is also could be dormant. You might not know it even happening. Weak or interrupted. And it could also be in full form. So if you have a lost thing that you don't know about or is hidden, I'm fine, I'm okay. It's like, no, you're not. There's something going on deeper that you're not really dealing with. That's a type of dormant one, maybe. You don't even know it's there. And this, these, what I'm talking about with pleasure, I'm talking about habits that come back or thought patterns that you thought you ended, you thought you buried it long ago, it's still there. That inkling of not de taking care of the business when it needs to get taken care of. Putting a, just covering it up. And we're hoping that when we're practicing really, really long-term practice, we're unearthing these kleshas and bringing them in to for like we're they're, eventually they're going to go away entirely when we practice enough because samadhi bhavana we're countering this 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 these kleshas that come up these thought patterns that are klishta they're negative that they come out as actions such as kleshas aversions attachments or actions like the avidya not knowing not doing anything about it so your yoga practice is really meant to bring up a lot of stuff and work on it, especially the dark ones or the hidden ones. They could be in for, for full form, the kleshas, and you, <laughs> you're just in denial that it's happening. But here's the most important one that I wanna to talk to you about today. It's just taken me a while to get there, forgive me. This sutra here, 2.5, Anitya Ashuchi, Dukkha, Anatmasu, Nitya, Shuchi, Sukha, Atma, Kyatihi, Avidya. 
here's the main definition of, 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 of what we think of often when we're practicing, what, what limits us from understanding deep, deep suffering or deep unknowing, is that we mistake the self, the true self, for the non-self. We're identifying with this outer form rather than listening to the inside. Or we think anitya, anything is, 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 is temporary. And really, it's, it's always changing. So anitya, nitya. A good way to describe this in modern terms would be, I'm stuck, I can't go anywhere. I can't change my job, I'm, I'm heavy, I'm this, I'm that. It's like, wait a minute, change is constant. If you think, you're, you're, you think everything is going on at once, or is fixed, it's not. There's always room for change, always room. So if we think that we might be in a rut when really we need to keep driving and to get out of, to move out from negativity towards positivity. Unclean ashuchi versus pure. Okay, so if we have something that is clean versus not clean, that's just like thoughts or your impression of yourself or your ego or your confidence. I can't do that. Actually, you can. Um, I'm, I'm not really thinking that way. You are. So unclean versus pure is also believing that yourself is pure, is good, rather than dukkha, negative. And that brings us to the next one. We identify with painful things. Whatever we take into the body, whatever we do, we think that's going to bring us joy. We mistook it. What, what is really going to make us joy is the memory of that yoga practice that we had, why we come back to practice. Samadhi bhavana. It brought about intelligence of the self, and it reduced these feelings. It reduced this klesha, these impediments to yoga, or these vrittis that are klesha that could be harmful, because it brought about the memory of the atma, of the nitya, the self that's shining and real, the shuchi, the pure self, the conscious self, the higher self, and the sukha, the joyful self. So let's try chanting this and we'll go into discussion a little bit and we'll see if you can stay with me. But so the Sanskrit buffs out there will chant the sandhi, the version where we just uh, chant this and then we'll open it up to discussion on some of your obstacles maybe in our last 20 minutes of our conference. Anitya shuchi dukkanatmasu nitya shuchi sukhatma khyatira vidya. Okay, um, stop the screen share now and we'll just open it up to the group and people who might be listening about um, anything that they want to share that could be any obstacles to their practice here in COVID-19, the home practice that they want to talk about that might be um, bigger than say just sleeping in um, or lifestyle or habits or things or even thought patterns, rittis that have been klishta, harmful, and then how we can counter that and make what, what we can do to remember. How are we going to continue to samadhi bhavana, continue to cultivate counteractive thoughts that are positive, that bring us towards awakening the self rather than not getting on our mat and working on it. And let's see, I thank you all so much for the, the conference, the changing of the pace and me running away and all that. We have a nice group here. Yeah, Tanya, go ahead and unmute yourself. It's delightful. Yeah, so I don't know if this is directly related to the concept of avidya, but maybe. Um, and something I realized that was getting in the way of my practice and that I was being maybe willingly ignorant of was my relationship with alcohol during this time as like a coping mechanism because everything's so boring. Um, <laughs> and I just noticed that 
oh, you know, having a glass of wine with my partner would feel like a nice way to unravel the day. But every day it kind of felt like I was snoozing the alarm button a little more, getting on the mat a little later, little excuses. And I feel like it's such a uninterrupted time because of lockdown that we really need to examine things that maybe we never had an issue with before Mm -hmm. and weird new habits that have come up that if we're not, if we don't shine the light of awareness on that we get from practice, we might ignore and then we could take with us post pandemic. So I decided to give up drinking at least through the lockdown and I've never felt like clearer and like it's just you you notice maybe how certain habits are magnified by the practice like oh i wasn't getting on my mat why and kind of using that as yeah. an investigative tool so just thought oh i think you're spot on like you you got it exactly like so it's a simple one but it's a big one because we're thinking ah that's how we're going to find that yogyata that that fitness for the self is through kind of that those, that limb of shaucha, that cleanliness. And it's easy. It's easy to go to think, to mistake things that's going to bring us some ease. Like, oh, okay, well, this will bring, this will take the edge off. Well, actually, it was the other way. We mistook it. That's the exact form of vidya mm. because we thought that would bring us what would bring us joy. Money is a good one. Well, if I make all this money, if I make all this money, we mistake the notion, the kyatehe, mm-hmm. the notion that. Something that we don't have will give it to us. Well, it's all right inside you. And we forget that easily when we're stressed. Yeah. Beautiful example. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. It's very tricky, right? To to stay to stay on the yogic path when there's there's not much to do. (laughs) Thanks. Anybody else want to share something? That was a good one. Brilliant. I want to share one too, is that that I've noticed in the Zoom room is that I've found that people think that the more, more of the poses are, it's a tricky one with Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, that we think perhaps that more asana or more will give it, give us that next clarity in the mind. And this is a tricky thing. And I'm, I, I want to bring it up because some not, not, not so much in our Zoom community, but in quite a few of online communities, people have gotten quite hurt. And what's happened is that there is a couple of ways, reasons why after a year of online study from a Zoom computer, yoga practice might go the wrong way. One is lots of different shopping, just doing lots of different classes and not having a very clear thing, but, or maybe not being established enough in a practice to know to practice by yourself, but because the teacher can only see so much. I can only see so much of where your back leg is. So you as a practitioner, it's very important to share this with you. You have to be taking really good care of yourself and not listening so much to me. You need to listen to me, but the more intuitive you can be with your breath, your bandhas, your internal lock and clarifying what you need to do every day is very important. Because if you just listen to someone else blindly, also a form of a vidya, you're just thinking, well, she's, she's going to help me do it. I'll just let her teach me. It's like, wait a minute. You also have to maintain this notion that you too are the guru. Your breath is your guide. And so um, if we overdo it on the mat and we think that more yoga is going to bring us uh, joy, that is not always the case. What's more, less asana, more clarity in the single position, more clarity when we find samastitihi, more clarity in that relationship with your breath and your pranayama practices. And so don't get me wrong. I'm not one of those people that's gonna say, you don't need asana. I hate that teacher that's like, oh, asana means nothing. Well, they finished four series. It's like, wait a minute, that's not true. We need to do excellent, quality, clear, awesome yoga, but we need to do it carefully and know that attaching to too much yoga or wanting more, then we end up having a little bit of attachment. That's a klesha. That's a klesha of 
wanting something or having a passion for it, a raga, an attachment for it, that might not always be the best thing. Comments about that? Anybody want to share about their asana once? <laughs> we all have them. I have mine too. Hi, Sarah. It's Philippa. I'm not going to put my camera on because I'm sat in my car outside the nursery. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I've been obviously listening and I can relate to both of those examples. One that Tanya gave, um, how easy during the last year, how easy it would be to use other things to wind down. But actually the impact on your yoga practice the next morning is quite impactful. And I, I realized quite a long time ago that alcohol and yoga just didn't go. Um, I used to be a bit of a party girl, um, and I, I, I had, to, had to make a choice. It was either yoga on a Sunday morning or it was out clubbing. Um, so, but that still creeps in, so I, I absolutely get that. And the point you made, though, Sarah, about attachment to asana and the amount of practice, one thing that this pandemic has taught me is, is how is, is teaching me rather it's not taught me is how to try and let that go I've always driven my asana practice I've always wanted more I've always wanted more asana more poses and it's always been a driver but in the current climate I find that because of my own personal situation with a small child around me all the time I have to let that go mm -hmm. um, and even this morning I did pranayama and I managed the sun salutations and had to just abandon my practice and I'm learning not to attach to it, but I could imagine that if I didn't have the distractions I've got at home, that in the current climate, it's something to hold on to. It's something to do more yoga, do more yoga. You've got nothing to do to do more yoga. I've got friends, the Shrangis, who have, don't have children and are just doing more and more asana, but getting more and more injured, um, um, and, but more, and becoming more and more attached to it because they think that's, that's helpful. And it's a very fine balance of when it uh -huh. trips over and not being helpful anymore. Um, so absolutely can relate to both of those things. Great. I mean, just think about the roots of Klish. You know, that's where I'm trying to get you guys to see the Sanskrit in the philosophies, like the root of your thought patterns, Klishta. They're, they're harmful, detrimental, or they're not. Like, so even your thoughts, like, are they helping us achieve yoga? And klish, klishta, like, gosh, impediments to yoga. They're like, there's not an aklishta. It's like, kle aklesha. It's, it's klesha. Those are like, okay. And attaching to more asana, think I have to do practice one time a day. I need a, I need a 24 hour break. That's why second practices, afternoon practice is not good for the body. Like, clear it, clarity in one time a day where you focus on your mat and a lot of mothers out there that finish their practices later, like do standing in the morning and a little bit of, and then do seated in the afternoon. It's just not enough time to get their practice in. So what we need to do is think, okay, I've got to get myself, wait, I got to get myself in the practice one time a day without error. And that's it. I'm not going to attach to more. Mm -mm. I used to do it too. I'll do the standing in the morning and then seated in the afternoon. Just do one time, all at once. And Monique had her hand up. Go ahead, Monique. And you go ahead. You don't have to have your camera. I was on. sharing. Hi. No, it's two a.m. in the morning here, so it's dark. <laughs> You're amazing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, um, I was going to second that motion because I noticed in the last, I think it was yeah, last month. I was working with my teacher so in the morning as well, about three to four times a week, and then three to four times a week, trying to work on drills for handstand. So, but more so for jumping back and jumping forward. And towards the end of the month, realized I'm exhausted. Why am I exhausted? And it took looking back at that schedule to, because you're practicing twice on Monday, twice on, twice on Tuesday, twice on Thursday, twice on Friday, that I was like, nope, I can't do anymore, I'm done. And so now this month I've shifted to taking the lessons from drills and allowing them to be intelligently reinserted into the practice itself, which is yes. where it belongs. So having that shift means that 
everything becomes more efficient and is always more focused on um, being efficient so that I can just get on the mat that once and physically get it done. Absolutely. One time. I mean, you, you know that in my teaching, when I share, do all your hip openers in the practice. Don't, don't do a second warm up practice to then come to Sama Siti. Really put it all in, in your show, put your drills in, put, do it, do your handstands between Navasana, as you know, where to put them in Monique, you've got great teachers around you. Like, do all those drills in, <laughs> in the practice. And then you might be like one of those students that looks like you're doing all this crazy stuff, but guess what? Nobody, nobody's looking at your practice. You think they are like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all this extra stuff. Mm -mm. It's your practice. It's yours. It's totally non-judgmental your practice. And that's why you have to stop thinking that it has to be in a box or a certain way or a certain time do the right amount of time for yoga for you every day in the same time with the right same parameters. And then in that time you do it, you make that practice time potently yours. All right, go ahead. You had your hand up. Do you want to share something, Vivo? I'm sorry, I don't know your name. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Swarnima and I'm from India. Hi. Um, yeah. And I've been, uh, I'm just a beginner. But I'm very active otherwise, you know, before pandemic and almost all my life. But with a child at home and the online classes, your meetings, the office, it gets really cumbersome. So when you're talking about, you know, daily practice and doing it too much on yourself, I used to do that like until a month before. Um, I used to just overstress on why am I not able to do a certain asana or why I'm not able to finish my one hour of practice every day at that particular time. But then I realized that, you know, I'm getting too hard on my children. I'm getting too hard on my family, you know, on myself more than anything else uh, to kind of, you know, finish my practice, do my practice daily for that particular amount of time. And uh, you know, today I got a lot of clarity that whatever I'm doing, I should just make sure that my breath, I'm comfortable with it. My mind is comfortable doing that. My body is at ease and that's most important. And, uh, you know, one way how I tried to include my, I have a six-year-old daughter, include her into my practice is that she puts up the asana for me. She puts up the mat, she puts up the music. So, uh, you, you know, she's also becoming happy that, okay, this is also my time. So kind of it has eased me out into my practice, into my daily affirmations that I do for myself that, okay, uh, I've got to do it. I'll not overdo it. And I'll just do as much my body can take. So I think, yes, that's very important. And this class has been, this conference has been really enriching. To, you know, you have reaffirmed that, yes, whatever I'm thinking is the correct thing. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, very good. Your rhythm, that's called your intuition. And I think it gets lost when we start to get into like the parampa lineage or you're, you're trying to follow the teacher. And that's why it's so important that you, yes, you have the teacher in a relationship with your teacher and you follow and listen to your teacher but not to an extreme that you harm yourself or you don't listen to your, your, to your, your, what you need to do for you. Yeah, Ruth, you had your hand up. What, what do you have to share? It's great. Uh, yeah, I just um, wanted to say that I really, you know, take such heart from what everyone's saying and um, that it's really encouraging and, you know, it's so much easy when you've got the Shala to go to every day and, you know, you're banging out your, straight practice and the teachers helping you with drop backs every day and you know you're binding here there and everywhere and then you're just on your own surrounded by lego <laughs> suddenly and the children just come in and you know climb all over you but actually i have to say in many ways i'm happier in my practice now and i feel a lot less stressed about it and a less um not I'm still attached to it, but in a much more sort of less bad cliche way, I think. <laughs> and, you know, your, your teaching is, you know, you constantly reminding us and there's a real like 
kindness in the teaching and I now look at intermediate and I see it completely differently than I did before and um so yeah it's been very helpful but one of the things I have been I wanted to ask you about is so what I've decided instead of telling my nephew to like go away or you know like don't interrupt me I'm like trying to get him next to me when I'm teaching or next to me when I'm doing chanting class or, or even if he comes down in the morning and I'm practicing I stop practicing um because I don't want him to feel like yoga is something that takes me away so I'm trying to get up earlier but then I'm worried that if I pranayama is in the middle of that practice what do I do do I stop because that has stopped me if I get up a bit too late and I think I want to do pranayama but then I'll be like only a little bit into practice so what do you think shall I just Get up I earlier. Think, I think, well, <laughs> your pranayama practice, you can always do that seated another time a day. That's, that's not really, an, it's not, it's asana because you have to be still and straight when you do your pranayama, but you can do your pranayama on the edge of a chair. You can do your pranayama on a bus. You know, you can scare some people with your pranayama on a bus, but like, well, we're not in a bus anyway, but uh, you can do, you can do the pranayama as a separate practice whenever you have time. And the asana practice, I would prioritize your asana practice. Um, if ideally, yes, get up earlier. Pranayama, yeah. then asana. However, it just time, place, circumstance, maybe perhaps, why don't you do your asana practice as a priority and save the pranayama practice? Because you know you can do pranayama when he's outside or you, when you don't have to give him the attention that he deserves. Mm. I wish yeah. I had the right answer. I don't know because you know no, what? That, it's a good answer. It's a good answer. I think it's just like these little, it, mainly I think just having the online community and like you said, like not, you know, shopping around. I don't even look at Instagram now. Like I literally look at your page and that's it. Like all these other people just selling yoga and fast track stuff. It just, I'm like not looking at it anymore. It's just a disease. <laughs> So I try to well, like you, Ruth. you and David. It's you know. You, the, the, speaking of David, quickly. Speaking of David, David's going to be oh, teaching in Europe. Oh bless, David. David's going to be speaking and pe teaching in Europe the 18th of April through Metalark. So that just came up yesterday. It was announced. So if you want to study with David Grieg here in Europe, at I think it's a practical time, right? Um, just check Metalark's website. They have it, uh, or they're they're. But David Grieg will be here in Europe in three, a little bit over a little bit under a little bit over a month. So that's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Ruth. And I just think that that's really important in this pandemic to watch your eyes, watch where you're looking, and watch what we're attaching to. We talk about eyes and being soft, and I'm talking a lot about this in your online classes. It's just inward looking. Try to keep looking at the navel, at the base. Gather the practice into the body. You know, like there's not, I mean, we, we reach out and we reach and find length through space, but where that might be going on in your limb, but what's going on inside is you're taking the practice internally. It's an invocation to the self. So when I say invocation to the self, the whole thing is a moving meditation. The, the breath, the bandhas, the drishti, try not to think about anything else. And when those rittis come, the mind churning, of the thought waves, counter them with productive, thoughtful, counteractive thoughts that are not negative. And so that will be a good way to go. Well, I'm gonna go into these next series now. I'm a bit afraid, here I go. I'm at home, I could it'd be easier if I was with Sarah the Shala or with the teacher. Here I go, I'm gonna do these dropbacks on my own. You just take the greatest care that you got a hold of your breath and your banda and you're listening to yourself, that you don't overdo it or hurt yourself during this online study. Yeah. Anybody else want to share something, Monique? Again, I'd love to hear from you again. I oh. just have a question. I had a pranayama practice uh, probably a couple of years ago, but in pandemic, I have lost it. And I was just wondering if you were teaching that. I'm teaching the pranayama on a Wednesday morning and a Sunday morning. So if you just came okay. for the first 20 minutes from 7 to 7.20 and okay. 8 to 8.20, it's actually turning to be more about a half an hour, but it's just the first 20 or half, 20 to, 30, 20 to 30 minutes of class. 
And I just teach the same thing every day. I don't add funny stuff in because I don't do funny stuff. I just do. That sounds silly. Like, what do you mean? You don't, it's like you can add your pranayama practices on, like you add on asana very, very slowly. So being okay. established in the specific four or five really healthy breathing patterns, that's enough. And then don't add more on until that's been established for many, many years. That's why we practice the exhalation first to build the root lock, to build Mula Bandha, Uddiyana Bandha. That's consistent with the Yoga Sutras, the Yoga Hatha Pradipika, and Sri K. Patabi Joyce's teachings of the first Ashtanga Yoga Pranayama. It's always an exhale first. That's similar also to pranic, to primary series. Exhale forward, man. exhale forward. Man. So we build the base, the root of the exhalation first before we start to inhale. And you'll see that the more and more you practice that your kumbhaka, your exhale retention is the first thing we want to learn when we're doing lots of pranayama. And you can do just that over and over. <laughs> Meaning the same theme of the asana. Lots of asanas are great. But you know, there's that funny story. Like I, I've heard this story so many times. I, I'm sorry if I've heard it, but if, if I might have said it so many times, forgive me. It's like, the, you know, the student says to the teacher, well, if I learn four series, will I be enlightened? And he said, oh yeah, for sure. Well, if I learn the third series, will I, will I be enlightened? Will I? Oh, yeah, yeah, you will. What about the second? Can I still get enlightened? Can I still find Samadhi through second series? Definitely. No way. Can I get it during primary series? <laughs> and am I going to achieve awareness of the self by just doing primary? And the teacher says, yes, of course. And then the student says, well, why do I have to learn all these series? And the teacher, the student says, why do I have to learn all this? And then the teacher says, because you didn't get it the first time. <laughs> so how much yoga do we really have to do? The single position in any series, whether it's advanced asana, whether it's Ash or it's primary series, those also postures are also very advanced, but the single position, that's any asana, all has the same base. All right, you guys, anybody have anything else to share? That's us just past 9.15. Um, I apologize for moving around my house. I think we made it. And um, if anybody has anything else to share, we'll just do a little bit more, five more minutes or so. Caleb, Anne, anybody? Wonderful. Well, let's go back to this. Oh, go ahead. Yes, Hannah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> tell us, tell us, Hannah. Oh, you know, it's hard. It's, it's a personal challenge to me. You know, waking up in the morning, it's a struggle. But I'm, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm working on my mindset. I'm trying really hard. I get some support from my kids. They've been very good. You know, they're waking me up in the morning. Uh, but I'm working on it. I know how great it is for me, for my practice. And primary is not getting me so tired as it used to be. So it's kind of getting there, getting smooth, even it's still very clumsy, it's still heavy, but it's getting me into the point when I feel a little bit more freedom. And, and it brings me happiness. Once I'm, I've done it, I'm really happy that I've done it. <laughs> I know, right? So we try not to attach to that joy, but it's so happy, yeah. Well, it's a kind of... Um, Achieving something, you know, these days, every single day is, is pretty much the same. So those little kind of winnings are kind of highlights of the days. So I think it's kind of good to focus on, on those little winnings, you know. So oh, I, yeah. Yeah, I try to keep this mindset like, okay, just do it, you know, get a nap in the afternoon if I miss a few hours of sleep. Um, if I miss the practice, I'll do this, you know, and do it later during the day, but just do it and, and, and think less. And there is my doggy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, watch your time you go to bed, like, you know, electronics, try to get your electronics off at a decent hour. Try to 
tone yeah. everything down, TV, phones, just start to just try to get more quiet and internal at night. And that'll help you sleep more. Mm-hmm. And the same, same rhythm, same time you eat, same time. Like that's the key is just getting everything in a rhythm. Same time you go to bed, same time you have your meals. And if you're one that has dinner some days at 3 p.m., sometimes 8 p.m., if you're not having those regular meals, those also really help you regenerate strength and stability and and uh, elimination as well. So you're ready to practice at that same time. I mean, does anybody have their alarm set for the same time every day? And then on a Saturday morning, you just get up at the same time. The alarm didn't go off and you're like, okay, you, you found Excuse yourself. Me, Sarah, uh, yeah. I, can I ask you a really a question about that a specific thing? So when I was practicing at like seven, I always finish my dinner at like six, but now um, if I have to practice at half five, there's no, I'm like still full up in a way. So what time should I eat? Like my last thing? Early, early as possible. Right, okay, cool. I have noticed that. If you're me, you know, the last, definitely me. I I don't eat past 6.30 p.m. Right. Seven max. And then I'm on my mat at at 4.35. So I wouldn't eat past that. You need to do that. What sort of thing? Because like my dinner, I still hanging around then. If I eat, it's 5.30. Just, just eat life. Eat your biggest yeah. meal of the day in the, in the middle of the, your biggest meal of the day in the middle of the day. So okay. lunch is your biggest meal. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Dinner, dinner is important, definitely, but maybe not as much as say, like your fast, breakfast and lunch, you're breaking fast, but breakfast and lunch are your biggest meals. And that's hard to be like, if you're not a morning person, well, we're hungry because we just finished practice. So it's not hard to have a nice hearty breakfast, porridge, 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 like eat your oats and your cooked hot food, trying to stay away from cold foods, try to eat warm, hot, um, sattvic foods. Like, you know, the old, the, your mother and your father, whoever cooked for you as a child, and they made you the stew. That's what you eat. You eat like hearty, good food that's warming. None of this dieting yogis. Three meals of solid, good food that's clean and healthy. Uh, I'm not an Ayurvedic specialist, but I would say if you can get as much dal into your diet, the better. Turmeric, asvatita, building building those nice, um, easily digestible foods. However, you know, everybody's different and you have to cook for family. And sometimes I make like three dinners. I'm like, ah, I can't count myself three dinners because <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, yoga food, this food, this food. It's like, all good hot warm food is what we need and if you can get the dal and the, and the rice in there that is the most easily digestible and that's your yogi food food for yogis yeah um let's see um any other fun things that we want to talk about in our in our community conference <laughs> chat about life it's turning out really nice okay Let's just do the last chant together, you guys. I've got the nice sahana. Um, oh, I know what I have for you guys. This is what exactly what I wanted to do. So I want to sing the Shiva Lingam with you. So I have this little chant book here that I got when I went to Mysore. It's this really sweet little chant. And there's two versions of it. And there's two pages. So the other page, once we get to the bottom of this one, we will need to open up another window. So forgive me about that, but um, make sure it's nice and big for you. And we'll just practice and just follow along and do your best. And then you can go anytime if you'd like. Now the Shiva Lingam is the sign of uh, the symbol of the Shiva Lingam. It's consciousness, it's, it's truth, it's the self, it's Purusha listening it also represents the internal the internal quiet one brahma murari sura chita lingam nirmala bashita shobita lingam janmaja dukha vinashana lingam Dart pranamami sada shiva lingam. Deva muni pravarchita lingam. Kamadaham karuna karalingam. 
Ravana Darpa Vinasana Lingam Tat Pranamami Sadashiva Lingam Sarva Suganda Sulepita Lingam Buddhi Vivardhana Karana Lingam Siddha Sura Sura Vandita Lingam Tat Pranamami Sadashiva Lingam Kanakama Mani Bushita Lingam Panipati Veshita Shobhita Lingam Dakshasunyana Vinashana Lingam Tat Pranamami Sadashiva Lingam Kum Kumachandana Lepita Lingam Pankajahara Sushobita Lingam Sanchita Papa Vinashana Lingam Tat Pranamami Sadashiva Lingam Deva Ganarchita Sevita Lingam Bavar Bavik Bhakti Birarva Chita Lingam Dina Karakoti Prabhakara Lingam Tat Pranamami Sadashiva Lingam Ashtadalo Parivishtita Lingam Sarvasam Uptvava Karana Lingam Ashtadaridra Vinashana Lingam Tat Pranamami Sadashiva Lingam Sura Gura Sura Vara Pujita Lingam Sura Vana Pushpa Sadarchita Lingam Parat Param Paramat Makalingam Tat Pranamami Sadashiva Lingam Thank you, everybody, for joining me, and we'll see you all on the mat. I'll see you Sunday for lead class, pranayama in the morning. And anytime you have anything else you want to uh, send me a question for the next your next your next month's conference, um, anything that you like that we didn't go over or you felt like you wanted to share another time, and send it to me. Have a wonderful day. Namaste.